Lisa is a New York Times bestseller and international author. Her books are published in 26 countries. I know that last month we chose Beautiful Lies, Lisa's book, as one of our books to be discussed by the literary divas. And I can tell you, ladies, it was a page turner. So you're in for a very thrilling afternoon. Uh, our program today um, is a fundraiser, and the proceeds from today's program will be used uh, for special programming at the Rocky Bluff Library. So we really thank all of you for coming for this event. And it's my pleasure to introduce Penny. Um, our, our speaker is Lisa Unger, as you know, and she's author of many books, um, some of which have been on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, she's going to tell you about herself, but we really feel fortunate that we uh, were able to get her to come today, that she accepted our invitation. Um, you may be interested to know how we found Lisa, because it's kind of an interesting story. For the past several years, a group of the divas have um, attended the Mystery Mingle in Sarasota. Um, it's an event that um, mystery writers from all over the state of Florida um, attend, and their free evening is a Friday evening, and uh, there's Cash Bar, and it's Meet the Author. Um, the Sunday before that, I was looking in the Herald Tribune and there was a big article on Lisa Unger and I read it with interest and I said, oh wow, <laughs> wouldn't we be lucky if we could get her to come. Uh, so we divided the list of authors that were going to be there and seven of us had an assignment to go and interview each author. And, and after we left, we went to the Columbia restaurant to have dinner, and we talked about everybody and who we thought would be good, and, and et cetera. It was really a lot of fun. So um, anyway, it was unanimous, a unanimous decision to have uh, Lisa, ask Lisa to come. So. <laughs> so anybody that wishes to join us for the next uh, mingle, keep, keep in touch with me, and I'll be sure and let you know it's really a fun evening. So. Without any further ado, I want Lisa to come up here and talk because that's why you're here. So, thank you. So I'm just gonna start out um, to say thank you to Penny, of course, for inviting me to this wonderful luncheon. And before I talk about myself, which you know, I'm happy to do. I wanted to say um, a few words about the Friends of the Library. Um, over the last couple of months, year, I've been getting notes from people, um, librarians, saying, I want to carry your book in my library, and I can't because my new book budget has been slashed. And I, I always feel sad when I hear this because I think libraries are sort of the front lines of civilization. There should never be a book that a child or a person wants that he or she can't get because they can't afford it. Um, that is, you know, as we were talking earlier, it's un-American that, you know, books should only be accessible to people with money. Um, so I feel very grateful for the Friends of the Library um, because before any of us are writers, we are readers. We all fall in love with story, you know, within the pages of a book that somebody reads to us as children. And so uh, thanks to the Friends of the Library for supporting the libraries and supporting readers, and in so doing, supporting writers. 
Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. So I think that writers are, um, I think we're, we're born, not made. It's like a disease, a congenital condition. So hopefully you find out what's wrong with you early on. Otherwise, maybe you wind up institutionalized rather than publish. And I have always, um, I can't remember a time in my life before I defined myself as a writer. And all through school, I had encouragement to write. I you know, wrote pretty much anything I could think to write, you know, just terrible poetry, short stories, plays. And it was really, the written word has been the place where I have most naturally expressed myself. Um, but I never really thought that it was a job or that it could be a job because that's what my father told me. <laughs> my dad is an engineer and um, he thinks that, you know, or he thought that writing was a very nice hobby for people, but that, you know, there was no work in it. Um, and so we had a deal, me and my dad. He said, you know what, kid, go to college. You can take basket weaving for all I care. But when you graduate, you're off the parental payroll. You get a job. You don't move home to write your novel. You don't travel around Europe to find yourself. You go to work. So, and I always listen to my dad. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but I did in this particular case. And I wound up um, going into publishing because really it was the closest thing I could do to following my dreams without actually um, committing myself to doing what needed to be done. Um, so unfortunately, I went into publicity and unfortunately I was very good at it. Um, and so I, I was working for one of the biggest publishing companies in the, in the country and basically putting authors in the media, putting them on the road and um, just getting the word out there about people that were being published. That's what a publicist does. So, um, and in doing that, my job kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the time I spent writing got smaller and smaller and smaller to, until I got to a point where I really wasn't writing at all. Um, that's better. Did that staticky sound stop? OK. Um, so I had kind of an epiphany where I realized that everything about my life was wrong. I was in the wrong relationship not luckily to the man I'm married to right now, but at the time, was in the wrong relationship. I was dedicating 110% of myself to a job that I didn't love, and that the only thing I had ever really wanted to do with my life, the thing that defined the most important part of me, was kind of slowly slipping away. And I realized that that was the time, that five years, 10 years down the road, I was gonna have to look back and say to myself, you know what? You never even tried to do it. And I figured I could live with spectacular sort of crash and burn failure, but I wasn't going to be able to live with a slow fade to nothing. Um, so I did what writers have to do. Uh, I wrote. Because <laughs> 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 real writers don't think about writing, they don't talk about writing, they sit down and they put the words on the page. And that's what I started to do. And from the day that I started doing that, it took me about a year and a half to finish my first novel. Um, that was not, um, that's not entirely true because the, the book that I finally finished when I was 29, I started when I was 19 which is, I mean, that's 10 years, okay, which is a little bit embarrassing because it's actually not that long a book. But <laughs> life has a, you know, has a habit of getting in the way of the things that you really want to do. Um, but I managed to finish this book. And now, even though I had finished it, finally, I didn't really know what to do. Yeah, I worked in publishing, but I was on the publicity side. So I didn't really know what to do with my book. And also, I was kind of a closet writer. You know, when you work in publishing and you're also a writer, it's kind of like being uh, a waitress in LA and really being an actress. Like, who isn't, right? <laughs> so, and you're not gonna be, you know, sitting at, at dinner with Nora Roberts or Tom Clancy 
and go, oh, you know what, Tom, I'm a writer too. <laughs> Writers don't want to hear that. So I, um, I didn't really know what to do, and I kind of shelved it. I was just happy that I had actually accomplished this thing that I had intended to do. And I went down to visit a friend in Key West. And um, I had long since broken up with the boyfriend and moved into my own place. And I was vacationing with my friend at Sloppy Joe's in Key West. And that's where I met my husband. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. The relationships that start at Sloppy Joe's are usually a bit more short term. <laughs> uh, we just celebrated our 10th wedding anniversary. Thank you. But I truly see that moment of meeting Jeff um, as the, the point on which my entire life sort of pivoted. And um, from that point forward, from meeting him, it was six months from that day to the day where we had both quit our big corporate jobs, sold our homes. I took my manuscript and sent it to my top, you know, like my five top choice agents, and we moved to Florida. My father said, <laughs> and I'll use the mic for this, this is an uncalculated risk. <laughs> and it certainly was an uncalculated risk, but you know, all the good ones are. And so we moved to Florida, and I was still doing sort of freelance public relations work. And um, I mean, I have to say, I was all the way out there, you know. I had totally gone for broke. I had quit my job. I had given myself and sold my place in New York and given myself a year to try to sell that book, which I had no expectation of doing, knowing what I knew about the industry, and write another one that maybe somebody would buy. And um, so I, in that time, I remember it as being extremely frightening, you know, because it wasn't even a matter of, you know, what do I do if I don't do this? It was more like, who am I if I'm not this? And luckily, <laughs> I pretty quickly got signed on by an agent, and she sold my first two books. These are not the Lisa Unger books. I wrote a series of four books for St. Martin's Press under my maiden name, Lisa Michonne. And um, this deal was brokered, and it was a the first book, Angel Fire, um, again, I started it when I was 19, is about a, a true crime writer. And her name is Lydia Strong. And she um, basically perceiving a great deal of chaos in the world because of what her life was as a child. She seeks to order chaos through her writing of these true crime novels. And she finds herself chasing monsters. Um, and a lot of times, you know, those monsters turn around and, and chase her, too. Um, and so a series developed from that book based on the strength of that book. When St. Martin's bought it, they wanted more books with her. And so I embarked on the writing of a series. So I wrote um, for St. Martin's Press. I wrote two books and then a, a, a third. Um, it was Angel Fire, The Darkness Gathers. The third one was Twice. And the fourth one in my contract was a book called Smoke. Is this just about the way I'm holding it? Is that why it's getting fizzy? Um, so. In between the third and the fourth book in the contract, I wrote something else. This is obviously before I had a child. <laughs> so I was actually you know, writing more than my contract demanded. And I wrote this book, um, and it kind of came from a really personal place. At that time, Jeffrey and I were really deep in thought talking about having a child. And I was really thinking hard about what does it mean to be somebody's parent, and what does it mean to be somebody's child, and what do I want to bring forward with me, and what do I want to what do I want to leave behind? Um, and I was really, and that's what writers do, right? We overanalyze everything, so obviously it was like a big thing. And of course, it doesn't take a panel of shrinks to figure out how this all works. While I was in my uh, picking up the mail one day, I got a postcard, and we've all seen them. They're the white and blue postcards, and on the back. There's an advertisement, and then there would be a picture of a missing child. And in this case, um, it was a, a you know age graduated, meaning that this child had been lost and never found. And I thought, what if 
I looked at this photograph and recognized myself. And it was that point from which Beautiful Eyes spun out. Um, and I think that's kind of the way it works. You know, you've got something going on within you as a writer, something subconscious, and then there's a trigger, a spark, like in this case, the postcard. And if it connects with something deeper, um, then a novel is born. Of course, my parents will tell you that Beautiful Eyes is really just my 500-page fantasy on how I'm not really their child. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, that's not true. <laughs> so I, I wrote this book, and um, I gave it to my publisher, um, which you know you have to do. <laughs> it, you, they have what's called right of first refusal. They have to see it before anybody else sees it. And it was not part of my contract. My contract was for a fourth Lydia Strong book, which I intended to write and eventually did write. Um, but this book was um, you know, Beautiful Eyes, and I gave it to my editor at St. Martin's, and guess what? They didn't want it. Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> That's not a good day, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> It turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me, but that moment is not pretty, you know, because that was a book that welled from a very personal place within me. And I could see, too, that it was better than anything that had come before it and that it represented my evolution as a writer. And my editor said, well, we want you just to keep writing what, what you've been writing. That's what we want. And that's not a good thing to hear, because when you can't go forward with what you need to do, and you know there's a different direction for you, it takes a lot of, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a, <laughs> a nice way to say it, guts, <laughs> to, to keep going in that other direction. Luckily, I had um, a truly, and still have, my same agent for, for 10 years, going on 11 years. And she said, it's time for us to move on. This book is special, and we will find a home for it. And I said, OK. <laughs> and so there's another leap of faith. Um, I wrote my, the fourth book in my series, which I did want to write and which I loved writing. And um, Beautiful Eyes very quickly got picked up by, by Random House um, and went on to um, be published in 26 countries and to be a New York Times bestseller and um, basically just to be what wound up being the next level of my career. Um, I changed, I started writing under my married name and somewhat left the Lisa Michonne books behind. Uh, but I'll get back to that. Because <laughs> they're coming back. <laughs> um, so I went on, so when I, when Beautiful Eyes came out, um, during this whole time there was a small event of my having a baby and when Beautiful Eyes came out, my beautiful daughter, Ocean, was uh, four months old. And so we all went on the road together. <laughs> I had been writing the sequel to Beautiful Eyes, Sliver of Truth, while I was pregnant. And I was basically kind of, during that whole phase, like racing her to the deadline. I was like, you know what, look, <laughs> just stay in there until the book is done. <laughs> and then when you come out, I swear, I'm all yours. <laughs> But she wasn't having it. She was born on, on Christmas Day, um, 2005. And I called my mom when my water broke. And I said, oh my god, mom, I didn't finish my book. And she said, <laughs> <laughs> she said don't worry about that now, kid. <laughs> You've got bigger fish to fry. And so um, when she was my, my four-month-old nursing infant, and I, and my husband, and my parents, <laughs> went on a 14-city book tour. <laughs> and I always say about Ocean that she's been breastfed in over 100 bookstore parking lots across the country. <laughs> so it kind of turned into a big um, family. Well, the business in itself, I I'm the writer, but you know writer works alone. And it's become a very um, family centric <laughs> business. We all still go everywhere together most of the time. Um, then uh, after Sliver of Truth came, 
came blackout. And again, it's interesting for me to, to look back on my work because when I write a book, I don't actually know anything about it. <laughs> when I sit down to write, I generally have a, a character voice in my head um, and maybe I'm seeing something. And I have no idea what's going to happen day to day. I don't know who's going to show up and I don't know what they're going to do. And I certainly don't know how the book is going to end, ever. So you must, you know, if you, you must understand about yourself that this is coming, whatever it is you're writing is coming from the very deepest place of your subconscious. And so it doesn't, again, take much to figure out how things work. And Blackout, what I was seeing was, and Blackout's my first book that was set in Florida. Primarily, everything has been very New York-centric because that's where I'm from. But I had been in Florida for many years. And this place had started to sink into my, my skin as well. Um, and uh, all I kept seeing was this woman in the bow of a boat. And she was in flight. And she was terribly afraid of something. And the only thing I knew about her was that she was dead wrong. That whatever she thought was chasing her was something else altogether. And that's all I knew about Annie Powers when I started writing about her, um, the protagonist of, of Blackout. And here's a woman who is deeply fractured. Um, she was, I didn't know day to day whether she was sane or not, and whether what she was seeing was actually real or not. And I was only about, I was about 75% <laughs> through the book when I realized what was actually happening. So that was good. But, it, <laughs> but the thing that was notable about Annie is that more than anything in this sort of, you know, the, the fiction struggle that she was having is that she was struggling with a fractured self. And in that first year when Ocean was part, the, the biggest part of my life, I too was feeling very fractured. You know, I was, I, I knew that I would love my child. I mean, obviously everybody knows that, right? But I didn't realize that I was going to be absolutely floored by like just a laser zap of pure adoration. And that it would, that she would completely redefine what it meant to love anyone. And so I had this real balancing act going on. You know, when I was with Ocean, I was worried about work. When I was working, I was worried about ocean. And I felt really fractured because what I do is somewhat indivisible from who I am. I mean, not somewhat, it is. It's indivisible from who I am. It's part of who I am. So it's not like I could just quit my job. I, if I did that, you know, like I say, I would probably be in an institution somewhere. It's where I exercise all my demons. And so my year um, writing Blackout was finding my place of balance. And what's interesting is to see how Annie, Annie, who's been um, horribly abused and who has had all of this tremendous trauma to the degree where she's kind of abandoned herself a little bit, the only thing that motivates her to find herself again and to create wholeness is uh, her daughter. And so her journey, even though it's wildly different from anything that took place within me, is a very, very intimate. And I think that we could, I could probably say the same of of pretty much all of my books. I, I know I can. Um, a Die For You I wrote um, when I was supposed to be having a vacation. <laughs> I had finished Blackout, and, and it was maybe the um, most intense writing experience of my career. And um, I went to Prague for five weeks. We had started doing a, a home exchange thing, so a family from Prague came and stayed in our house. And we went there for five weeks, the three of us, me, Jeff, and Ocean. And I was supposed to just be a tourist in Prague, which was very appealing. Um, but that city, <laughs> has anybody ever been there? It is um, stunning, to say the least. And it also has this characteristic that just is like catnip for me. It shares something with New York City and also with Florida, too, that there are these two selves to each place. You know, New York City is, it's all hustle and bustle and, you know, all very glitz and glam, but there's, you know, a very definitive underbelly, a real division between the haves and the have-nots, 
um, a real personality and a life and a throb that exists only there, right? In Florida, you know, it's all sort of oranges and Disney and, you know, kitschy, <laughs> you know, oh, it's so sunny and nice. But, you know, no, because there's a, there's a dark underbelly here as well. Also, you know, a system, a karstic topography. So underneath Florida is just this system of caves and tunnels where, you know, creatures live that cannot even exist in the sunlight. Um, and it's just got that tremendous energy. And if we ever, for one second, stopped, you know, cutting it back and trimming it and manicuring it and laying down concrete and sticking in rebar, Florida would reach out with its big dark fingers and take it all back in a minute. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that really ignites my imagination. And Prague, the same thing. I mean, here we have Prague. It's like this ancient city, completely beyond gorgeous. I mean, the most stunning architecture, you know, preserved in a way that almost nothing else was, you know. Um, and just having this renaissance from, you know, from the, the fall of communism in 1989, the, Vel the, the Velvet Revolution saw Prague come back to life. But, I mean, here we have, like, the Charles Bridge, this ancient bridge, black sort of moaning saints, you know, head tilted up to God. Meanwhile, there's like a flood of tourists in Praha t-shirts eating ice cream. You know, but then you turn the corner and there's this dark alleyway and, you know, a wrought iron gate and nobody's seen that courtyard for 50 years because it's been blocked off by something else. And it just drove me crazy. You know, I thought, this place has a secret heart and don't we all? And that was, that was the first, Die Free was the first book that was actually inspired by a place. Um, and she was also, Isabel Rains, who is the, um, the protagonist of that book, is also my first uh, fiction writer heroine, which was very interesting. It was nice to be working with somebody who thinks the same way that I do. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I feel like mystery writers make, well, writers in general, fiction writers, make pretty good detectives. So she's another one of my, I'm not going to say reckless, I'm going to say courageous heroines who gets herself into some interesting places on the streets of Prague and New York City. Which brings me to um, Fragile. Fragile was uh, a very personal book for me because it's the only book that features centrally an event from my own past. And there was somebody who is also from Long Valley. Is that person still here? Hi. Um, when I was 15 years old, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but when I was 15 years old, a girl I knew was abducted and murdered. Um, it was a, she wasn't a close friend of mine, but she was somebody that, she was my classmate. We were, played in the same orchestra. And she, um, you know, was uh, maybe one of the, First, I don't know, certainly the only people to have anything like this ever happen to her in a place like Long Valley, New Jersey. Um, it's the kind of place where everybody moves their kids from the city to be safe. And um, it was a, a, a horribly, I mean, obviously, there's really nothing I can say except that it was a horribly impacting event. And for me, it changed the way I saw the world. Um, and it stayed with me. I'm not going to say that it laid heavy on my heart, but it was something that I always returned to and thought about in my mind. But here was a girl who missed the bus home from school, and her mother was mad. She said, you know what, walk. And it was not a mile, you know, in a safe, idyllic, rural town. And in that moment, you know, one person changed everything, you know, took somebody precious and beautiful and, you know, robbed the whole world of her and everything that she might have been. That said, uh, this book is not about that event. I had a true horror of ever exploiting anybody uh, or causing pain to people who had already experienced more pain than anybody deserves in one lifetime. 
Um, but so what I did tell was my part of the story to tell, how it, how it impacted me um, and how it impacted a town and impacted a family um, and how the choices that were made in those moments um, had reverberations that uh, continued on through, through generations. Um, and it was, in, in a lot of ways, it's interesting because I've tried to tell this story before um, over, my, over the course of my writing career. It's shown up. I've started to see the edges of it uh, in other things that I've written. But I could never make it a novel. I could never find a way, I could never find the voices that I needed to um, resolve the story. And it's notable a couple things. I learned about when I was writing Fragile, I learned that you can have ambitions to tell a story and as a writer and not have the talent to tell it, not have the skill or the craft that it takes to tell it well. And I think, I honestly think that it took me the writing of eight novels to have what it took to write Fragile, my ninth novel. Um, and it's also interesting to know that the voices that finally managed to tell it were older than anyone who had tried to tell it before. And so I feel like maybe I needed to grow up a little bit too. I needed to be a wife and a mother and somebody with distance from an event that you know, shattered and destroyed and, and rocked everything that was around it. So that was a very, um, it was a very personal writing experience for me. And uh, Jones Cooper, I don't know, has anybody read Fragile? I'm not going to give anything away. Uh, Jones Cooper, who is, starts off as being, you know, Maggie, Maggie Cooper is really this, the, the linchpin of the book, but Jones has a very significant role. And um, at the end of Fragile, I found uh, that I couldn't move on from him, that he had, man, a lot going on. <laughs> and there are a lot of questions that he had to answer and a lot of things that he had to answer for. And so um, my 10th novel, which will publish this August, uh, is entitled Darkness, My Old Friend. And um, it'll feature Jones Cooper, who is popularized in the novel Fragile. <laughs> so I, I, it's, it's hard to look, o look back over the course of your life and, and your kind of your body of work. Um, you know, especially writing the way I write, it's, I never really know what books are about until they're done, until they've been done for a while. And I've gone back and read and re-edited. I mean, and I say that from the most, you know, humble place because I know that there's a craft and obviously I've learned mine and honed it and continue to hone it every day and every day I seek to be a better writer than I was the day before and you have the ability to do that but there's also something bigger there's something outside yourself or maybe so deep inside yourself that it seems like it's outside yourself um, and that's part of it too so it's but when I look back over my work work <laughs> I can see its evolution. I've had, a, I've had the opportunity, which most writers don't have, and that is the opportunity to grow. My first book, I um, started when I was 19. When I turned in my 10th novel, I was 40. I think if you look at that book I wrote, the first book I wrote, um, it, you'll see me in it, but I hope it's unrecognizable <laughs> in many respects from the book I wrote at 40. I mean, I feel like, you know, I can look back and, and stand behind every book as the best that I could do at that time and that each book is really intimate to whatever phase I happen to be in. Um, and I try to think of, you know, there are certainly a lot of themes that I can see running through my work, um, especially the later work, the Lisa Unger work, where I feel like you know the first four books that I wrote um, are the place where I cut my teeth. It was like my education. It was where I learned how to be a writer. And in fact, um, the good news about those books is that they're coming back. My publisher, Random House, has uh, bought them all. And they're going to be republished sometime over the next couple of years, Lisa Unger writing as Lisa Michonne, which makes me very happy because 
you know, I've been wanting them to have a wonderful home for a really long time. <laughs> they're very special to me, and so I'm happy that they're going to be out there once again, you know, to have a, a new life. And so when I look back, I think, I, I try to think about the themes of my work, and I see the major theme I think, uh, the major theme I see is the theme about choices. How the choices we make in our lives, even the the littlest ones, even the smallest ones, and I think you can see this in every single book, have these far reaching effects, you know, that one moment, that any moment in your life, and sometimes it's just the little moments, you know. Do I cross this street or that street? Do I miss that train or do I catch it? You know, do I call this person who I met last night or not? Do I go back to Sloppy Joe's because I've been kicked out because I don't have an ID? <laughs> do I go back to my hotel and get my ID and then go back to Sloppy Joe's? Yes. <laughs> you know, and I think about those things a lot. Like if I had just said, ah, forget it, let's go someplace else. I wouldn't have Jeff. I wouldn't have Ocean, my daughter. You know, and those—that's the kind of thing that, you know, role, That's the kind of thing that writers think about, and it's crazy making. And so we make stories up to satisfy ourselves. And <laughs> the other thing I think that is true of all of my books is that none of them have an exactly easy ending. There are no real villains. Well, so, well, that's not true in the earlier books, especially. But there are some villains. There are some bad guys. But I don't really, in life, believe in villains. I don't believe that, yeah, I believe that there are people who make choices and that some people make great choices most of the time and some people make bad choices <laughs> most of the time and that it's easy to say those are he our heroes and those are our villains. But I think most of us make some good choices and some good, some good choices and some bad choices all of the time. And that's pretty much what we are. Those choices are like what chain link together to create the life that we have. And I think to see your fictional characters in boxes is to create a, a less interesting book. So in that my characters are a bit gray, um, you know, a little bit different. I think sometimes uh, the, my endings are not always easy. And I'll say this though about them is that at the end of every book, my characters don't always get what they want. But as the song goes, and as I tell my daughter, <laughs> they always get what they need to live to fight another day. And I hope that's true for my readers, too. And thanks for being here. If you uh, you guys aren't going to get shy on me, right? Do you have questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> Hi. What's that thing out? <laughs> I, I think my father is just really happy that he doesn't have to support me. <laughs> I think he's still a little confused, you know. It was like I'm the formula that went wrong. Like I had I it was like if you if you crack my dad's head open, like like pie charts and graphs would fly out. And I, I think, honestly, for my poor father, that I'm like the one, the one equation he could never quite solve. <laughs> but it makes for a very interesting uh, relationship. And he's very supportive. I mean, my, both my parents are tremendously supportive. They travel with us. They, you know, he's a great grandfather. Um, and, you know, but he does like to come to these events. He loves to come and, you know, he knows that he's going to get hassled by me. <laughs> and he, I think he kind of likes the attention, you know. And, um, but he always comes with a question. And it's always a really hard question, like really, really hard. Like he'll say, so um, how do you uh, balance plot development and character development? And... <laughs> Do you feel that you have to sacrifice one in order to achieve the other? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I could write a thesis on that, on that topic. And he said, you know, put it on my desk in the morning. Anyway. <laughs> uh, hi, Barbara. Lisa, do you work from an outline, and how many hours do you spend each day? Yeah, I don't, I don't work from an outline. I have no idea 
when I start a book, you know, where it's going to end, who's going to show up, what they're going to do. I don't even know what it's about. I mean, I literally don't know day to day what's going to happen. And if I outlined it, if I knew how a book was going to end, I couldn't even write it. I couldn't even dream of writing it. You know, it's like I write for the same reason that I read, because I want to know what's going to happen. Um, I, you know, I've, it's been very important to me to be a, a full-time mom as much as possible to Ocean. So it's funny how, you know, I write now the way I used to write when I was working a full-time job. That's how I. That's how I wrote. You know, I, I wrote on the train. I wrote, you know, at night after, you know, the end of my day, whenever there was time. I, I can't quite do that, but my husband and I have worked out a balance where, I mean, my golden creative hours are from 5 a.m. to noon. Uh, unfortunately, those are also Ocean's golden creative hours. <laughs> I think it has to do with me getting up every morning to write Sliver of Truth, and she was in there going, what's going on out there? You know, I hear that clatter of the keyboard. Um, and uh, we've sort of, now that she's getting older, we've, I'm finding my way back to those, to those hours. But I generally work in the morning. I generally start at 5 a.m., and I have some interrupted time when I'm getting ready, ocean ready for school and stuff and having breakfast with her. And then when she goes to school, I work. Um, I turn on the Freedom, you know, which is the the program I had to download to restrict myself from the internet, <laughs> which is sad, but you know that's just the reality of it. And um, and then uh, I and she has two full days, so I really work when she's in school. Um, but you know that's not to say that if I'm in a place where I really need to be working, I don't find time after she's gone to sleep or whatever. But I really try to find that balance between being a full-time mom and, you know, continuing to do what I, what I do. Yes? When you hit a blank, you know, you can't think of what to yeah. do next. What do you do to get out of bed? Do you have a, do you have something you do, like turn around the block or? Oh, yeah. Or <laughs> you know, I forgot that I was supposed to be repeating these questions. Um, the, um, the question was, what do I do when I run into a block? Do I have... Well, of course, I never do, but <laughs> what do I do to get myself out of it? Do I have some special routine? And it's, you know, what you say about running around the block, I mean, that's important. We're, you know, exercising and getting out there and just being out away from my desk is, you know, probably the most important thing to actually going back to put words down on the page. Um, but uh, I believe that, you know, writing like any organic process is an ebb and a flow and you have to be as comfortable in the ebb as you are in the flow and that you know there are going to be times where you're sitting there in front of your computer going hmm <laughs> i can't write this book i don't know what's going to happen and you kind of go through all the the gyrations that you do but eventually if you give yourself time or if you force yourself to put words down then um uh, you generally get through that 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 ebb period. You have to be comfortable with it. You have to understand it as what it is, which, which is a, I think, a gestation period. Um, and I, I my two my two favorite quotes about writer's block are uh, from the late Robert Parker: "Do plumbers get plumber's block?" <laughs> 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 which basically is like you've got a job, you do it. You know, <laughs> you know if you have. Um, you know, it's equal parts, the, the act of writing is equal parts magic and equal parts craft. And you kind of hope that on the days where the magic is not there, then at least the, the craft is there. You know, and when the craft is not there, at least the magic is helping you put, you know, real words on the page. And um, that's been an important philosophy for me. And then also, uh, John Dufresne says that writer's block is really just fear. And um, it's the desire to write well right now. And you can't always write well right now. Sometimes you can just write. <laughs> you can write well later when you edit. <laughs> so it's a, um, it's a process, you know. Hi. I don't know if that's true for me or not. I mean, I guess it depends on, I mean, I guess it depends on how you see your novel. You know, like, I don't, I don't necessarily, I know my novel does have a beginning, a middle, and an end, because it has to. But I'm not really, I mean, I, I think if you're, 
if your books are plot driven, maybe that's true, but in my case, my books are very character driven. I, I'm very focused on the people in the books. And so I may be having problems with a particular person at a particular time, and I don't really know what they're, you know, what they want to do, what they can do. Maybe I don't well, the, I know them well enough. They haven't, you know, they haven't opened up or whatever. So when I'm struggling, I don't necessarily know that it's a, a struggle of plot. Usually it's a, a struggle with a particular character. My characters are very strong headed, you know, not, you know, I don't know where they get it from, <laughs> like my daughter. <laughs> The, the question is, when I was in school, um, was I inspired by or encouraged by any teachers or did I participate in writing groups, student writing groups? I did not participate in student writing groups. Uh, I've never participated in a writing group at all. Um, but I have had teachers who were very, very important to me um, growing up, through not just through you know um, middle school, but also high school and uh, college as well. I've had significant teachers who have had uh, significant impact on my desire and confidence to write, and I've been, um, and I'm very, very grateful to all of them. And in fact, I actually answered this question just recently for a um, for an interviewer, and it caused me to to seek out the, my eighth grade English teacher, who I think is probably the biggest, the first person that said, "Hey, guess what? You're a writer. You know, stick with it." And I I found her on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> which was extremely cool and I wrote her a note and I said you know Mrs. Nehemiah you totally rock <laughs> <laughs> and I want and I wanted her to know that she was one of the first people that made me believe in myself in this way and so I wrote to her and sent her some books and she was very happy and that's a really nice thing about Facebook um, I guess I'll start over here hi, hi. Um, you said that you're never quite sure when you start yeah. Have you ever had it happen where the characters or even the plot evolves to a point or leads you in a direction that makes you go have to go back and revise the beginning? Or um, is it just automatic? Does it always flow smoothly? The question is, um, do I ever discover something about my story or about my character in the in the act of getting to know them? That, uh, that forces me to go back and, and revise. And I would say that that, that hasn't happened often. I th this is what happens more often, is that I write something, something happens, a character says something, or um, does something that I don't understand, or sees something that I don't understand. And rather than editing that, I generally just leave it whatever it happens to be. And often, later, I go, oh, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> and I don't know, and I've, and I've tried to explain this before. Some people understand this, and some people, like my father, <laughs> does not understand this. <laughs> like, he does not understand how this, could, how this could even actually be possible. And the only way I can explain it is that you know, I have been a reader all my life. I have been an avid, voracious reader of every single thing I could get my hands on, inappropriate or not, since the time I was a kid. And I have loved a story. Probably it's my first love of anything. And that I have read so much and for so long and so many different, so many different types of fiction. And my entire education is focused on writing and literature that in some very real sense, I have internalized the form of a novel within me. And so when I think of story, it kind of evolves the way a novel would evolve. And um, I, I don't know if I can explain it any better than that, you know, because it's just kind of the way my brain works, for better or for worse. Uh, hi. Who are the writers that you uh, read most and most admire? Well, I am, um, that's a, 
You think that's a simple question, right? <laughs> it's such a multi-layered, multi-faceted question for me. I would say I'm going to just go back to the beginning. Like the first people that really blew my mind were, uh, well, first my first thriller I think was Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, and that book really got my juices flowing. In that, you know, here was. And I think it's a theme that I see over and over again in my work now. The ordinary girl caught in extraordinary circumstances. And, you know, of course, then this big gothic story, you know, like, can you not see Mrs. Danvers even now in, like, Mandalay? You know, like, that is one of the first stories that really ignited. I almost fell off that bench. Oh, my God. <laughs> that would have been really... Not good. We would have had to. <laughs> would have had to end this conversation, um, and uh, that really um, that really impacted me because you know she was, you know here was a, a female writer who had written this. I mean, really classic thriller. Um, and then uh, there was uh, Truman Capote was a, another huge influence for me, um, and his book In Cold Blood, um, which is probably you know obviously it's a true crime book. It's not a novel, but it's. Um, it was the first place where I came to understand that you could write about crime and write about it with sort of breathless beauty. And that you could explore the psyche of extremely twisted and unwell individuals and do it with compassion and understanding and insight. And these things um, were really formative for me. These, those books were extremely formative for me. And I read them, you know, at an inappropriately early age. <laughs> my parents never restricted my, and they never restricted my reading. I don't know why they restricted everything else, but they did not, <laughs> they never restricted my reading at all. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I was like 10 and reading Stephen King novels. Yeah, oh, you groaned. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that, I mean, and that has been sort of, for me, I've been a, a real omnivore, you know, liking the, you know, the most classic literature, you know, from, you know, the Bronte sisters, Jane Austen, to, you know, Stephen King and Sidney Sheldon and the most pop possible fiction. Um, and I've just been a real lover of all kinds of books. Today, some of my favorite writers are Dennis Lehane, uh, Laura, Laura Lippman. Um, is another is another amazing writer. Um, Kate Atkinson is uh, just stunning. Uh, I could go I could go on and on. I probably have time for just like one or two more questions. Hi. Uh, just curious, have you ever been approached by a, a movie maker? I I have been. I've been optioned many many times, and um, nothing ever comes of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I've been, uh, my books have been optioned, Blackout's been optioned, and Beautiful Lies has been optioned. Both those options have expired, and nothing's happened. So that's kind of really more the way of things than the other. Um, I think about 5% of novels, um, about 5% um, actually make it to the big screen. Maybe even not as many as that. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, it would be difficult. It would be challenging. I, I would hope that it was, if it does happen, that it would be um, with the character that I was finished writing about. Because I don't know how I would feel to see somebody else. I mean, because I see everybody so clearly in my head, you know, and it's not like I'm seeing Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt or whomever. I, I, the people that I'm seeing are real to me. And everybody is going to be a sort of poor facsimile of that. Um, so I'm not sure how it would happen, but you know, or how it would make me feel. But I guess depending on how big the check is, you know, I could <laughs> I could find ways to comfort myself. <laughs> so I don't know. I guess uh, time will tell. I'll, follow me on Facebook. I'll keep everybody posted about my. My, my movie career, which seems to be off to an extremely slow start. <laughs> uh, okay, one more question. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. How much time do you spend in editing? Yeah, like a year. 
Seriously, yeah, I turn my um, I turn my book uh, my book in to I'll finish a draft. Um, it'll sit for like a week, you know, and that because obviously I don't know what it's about yet, so I have to go back and read it and figure it out. So I go back and read it, and there's an editorial process that occurs then with me. Um, and then uh, it'll go to my, my editor, and my editor will content edit it. And so it'll be a conversation, more like, what about this? And can we see more of that? And what, you know, what happens if this? And so it's really a collaborative conversation. And then, of course, it's up to me what changes are made and what are not. But then I go back into it, and then I'm back in it again for like at least another month. Um, and that's mainly... But the bones are usually there at the end of the first draft. I've never gone back and done massive rewrites to change plot or character or anything like that. From that point, it's really, usually my first draft winds up being somewhat over 100,000 words, and the second draft is usually about 110 to 115 words. So it's really flushing out, tightening up, and then I've got my hands in that thing until they like wrestle it from my grasp. <laughs> like honestly, I'm all over it every single pass. And then if, at some point I get cut off. They say, that's it, it's done. You know, perfect or not perfect, it's going to press. And, um, and you know, and I cry. <laughs> but I do let them take it and put it out there in the world. Well, thank you for your questions. Um, if you have any more questions or you would like me to sign your book, I'll be happy to do that. And thank you for having me.